Welcome to The Backstory with Dr. Ricky Singh. This podcast is focused on bringing you the latest research-based information about dramatically improving health, well-being, and quality of life. And here's your host, Dr. Ricky Singh. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Backstory. Today is part two of my three-part series that I am calling The Science Behind Six-Pack Abs. Last week, we talked about diet and the importance of healthy eating, minimizing sugary carbs, focusing on whole food, plant-based, all things very important to optimize your body composition, focusing on higher proteins and less simple sugars. Today, we're going to talk about exercise, specifically What are the best forms of exercise to lose weight, burn fat, and ultimately expose those abs hiding below this layer of belly fat? But first, let's talk about the history of exercise and the history of running. Back in the 1960s, jogging was something that only athletes and boxers really did. You remember that movie Rocky when Sylvester Stallone is running through the streets of Philadelphia training for his boxing match? Normally, most people didn't do it. And when they did, it was actually a cause for concern. The New York Times ran an article in 1968 stating that there were a handful of unusual freaks that were running in their free time. What's also interesting is that around that same time, in the same year, 1968, Senator Strom Thurmond, who was from South Carolina, actually was stopped by a police officer for participating in a suspicious activity And what was that activity? Jogging. So today, joggers are everywhere. I live in New York City. I see joggers on the east side, on the west side, running on First Avenue. And it's not unusual. You know, we call them runners. We're going for a run. But it wasn't really mainstream before that. That raises the question, where did jogging even really come from in the first place? And we have to look to New Zealand to thank for the jogging trend. Obviously, running existed before the 1960s, but the specific practice of recreational jogging on sidewalks and parks and just doing this for exercise was kind of unheard of before the 1960s. Again, serious athletes did it for training, but normal people like me and you really didn't. And we have to give credit for introducing this concept of jogging to Bill Bowerman. Now, many of us have not heard of Bill Bowerman. I was one of those people prior to doing some research on this topic. So Bill was a running coach, and he discovered jogging on a trip to New Zealand in the early 1960s. He came back, he was in Oregon, and he partnered up with someone named Phil Knight, who you may have heard of. Phil was a runner on Bill's running team, and together they founded this small running company known as Nike. And they popularized jogging and recreational running. In fact, around that same time, the American Heart Association and the American College of Sports Medicine came out with a recommendation for exercise. And they stated, exercise for 150 minutes a week or 30 minutes, five days a week. And those were the guidelines for almost 20 to 25 years. By the mid-70s, jogging was mainstream, and if you use the word cardio, it was kind of synonymous with jogging and running. And many, many papers and research showed that there was significant benefits of jogging, not just on the waistline, not just on to lose weight, but cardio exercise or aerobic exercise was shown to reduce cardiovascular disease, lower blood pressure, improve your cholesterol balance. But the reality is, majority of us and many people go to the gym predominantly to lose weight. And the idea, especially for me, of spending hours and hours plodding away on a treadmill can be discouraging. And honestly, I don't really have time for that. So what if there's a way to get the same results, to lose weight, to get some cardiovascular benefits, but not have to spend that much time at the gym? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. This is something called high intensity interval training or HIT. And HIT is all about the intensity. What this means is For every cardio session, you will do several short bursts of exercise interspersed with slower intervals. For example, you can sprint as fast as you can, or if you're on a bike, spin as fast as you can for a few minutes and bring that pace down for 10, 20, 30 seconds, and then repeat it. An example I like to give to patients is get on the treadmill, set the speed at two or three miles per hour, bring the incline up to whatever you can tolerate, whether it's 5% or 10% grade, do that for a few minutes, and then bring that gradient back down to flat for your 
quote, rest interval. But again, it could be anything from intervals of burpees or jumping jacks, mountain climbers, anything you do where the intensity is increased for a short period of time with some relative rest in between. And the beauty of this type of exercise is that you can do it from anywhere. You can go to a gym, you can do it at home, you can do it in the park. Now, if you want to go to a spin class or boot camps or boxing studios or other gyms, you have that option too. In fact, there's a billion dollar company called ClassPass that connects people to these fitness studios and these types of experiences. But one of the main appeals of HIT is that it's so accessible, you don't necessarily need an expensive gym membership or need equipment to get the cardiovascular benefits. And as a result of this newfound enthusiasm in HIT, the American Heart Association and the American College of Sports Medicine, along with other associations, revised their exercise statement. So previously, they said you should exercise for 150 minutes a week or 30 minutes five times a week. They revised that statement to say you could do that or you could just do 60 minutes of vigorous exercise, basically suggesting you can decrease the amount of exercise by two and a half times to still achieve cardiovascular benefits, health protection, and weight loss. How high intensity differs from what I'm calling low to moderate intensity or steady state cardio is in the intensity and duration. So in HIT cardio, you are using 80 to 90% of your maximum heart rate for a short period of time. Basically, when you are involved in this high intensity, you should not be able to have a conversation. Conversely, with steady state cardio or low to moderate intensity, you're about 50 to 60% of your max heart rate. So you should be able to hold a regular conversation while exercising and not feel too breathless. A very rough and ready way of calculating your max heart rate is 220 minus your age. So if you're 30 years old, your max heart rate is about 190 beats per minute and 85% of that is about 160s. So that would be your target if you're doing high intensity. If you're 60 years old, your max heart rate is 160 beats per minute, and 80 to 85% of this is about 140s or 150s. Workouts are made up of work and recovery phases, and the duration of each of those kind of depends on your program and the intensity. Another important distinction with high intensity training versus regular low to moderate intensity training is that HIT is mostly an anaerobic activity. And let's talk about that for a second. Anaerobic basically means without oxygen. Your body uses the stored glucose, which is in your muscles, without relying too much on oxygen. When you're doing high intensity interval training, the oxygen demand is greater than your oxygen supply. So your body has to find an alternate fuel source. And this is why you feel really tired when you're doing anaerobic exercise. Think about the sprinter, think about Usain Bolt. He runs for nine or 10 seconds and he's completely out of breath versus someone who has run 10K or a half marathon at a low to moderate intensity, finishes the race, and yes, they're gasping for air, but not quite as out of breath as the high intensity training. On the other hand, cardio is aerobic. This means oxygen demand meets oxygen supply. You can have a conversation with your running or exercise partner. But the ultimate question on this weight loss journey of getting this six pack that we all desire is which one is more effective at weight loss? And there have been numerous studies on this topic. When you look at two groups, one set of patients participating in high intensity training and another in this low to moderate intensity training, studies have shown that both lose body fat percentage, both lose the abdominal subcutaneous fat. However, the amount of time required to achieve some results was almost 75% less in the high intensity group. And the findings of these studies have been replicated many, many times. The results are very similar. Another important distinction between high intensity interval training and low to moderate intensity is what types of muscles we use. When you're doing high intensity, you are relying on your fast twitch muscles. These muscles are required for short, intense bursts of energy. Whereas in low to moderate intensity, you are using slow twitch muscles, and these are your endurance muscles for exercise. And when you look at the body composition of sprinters versus long distance runners, sprinters tend to look a little more muscular because they are firing these fast twitch muscles, which is also important in our elder adult population due to a condition called sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is loss of muscle mass. And if you can replace lost muscle mass with these fast twitch fibers, you're gonna improve your functional mobility. You'll walk better, your gait will improve. So all benefits of doing high intensity interval training. 
Another benefit in specifically diabetic patients is that high intensity interval training seems to improve your insulin resistance. And we talked about that last week. So if insulin in your body is circulating and more effectively pumping the sugar back into the cells, that's a great prevention strategy for diabetes and essentially heart disease. But perhaps the greatest benefit of high intensity interval training is that it raises your metabolic rate even after you're done working out. And this is a phenomenon called afterburn or oxygen debt, or technically it's called excess post-exercise oxygen consumption, EPOC, E-P-O-C. And basically this refers to the elevation in metabolism after your exercise ends. Why does this happen? Well, after you exercise, your body has to restore itself to homeostasis or restore itself to its resting state. And this process requires energy. So when you're burning calories during your exercise, you then have to replace that glucose with oxygen in your post-exercise phase. And the way in which your body replaces energy after you do high intensity interval training is with increased ventilation, breathing rate, elevated heart rate, higher core temperature. In fact, you actually release neurotransmitters and hormones in the bodies like adrenaline in the post-exercise phase, which contributes to increasing your metabolic rate. The question is how long does this afterburn last? And there's mixed data on this, all related to the fact that exercise is variable. How intense did you exercise? How long? What is your gender? What is your weight, your fitness level? All these things contribute to how long this afterburn lasts. Typically, it can last 15 minutes to 48 hours, and most of the studies suggest that you can experience increased oxygen consumption for about 24 hours after an exercise. And how does that relate to calorie expenditure? Again, while there's no clear answer, in part to the variability of the nature of your exercise, most studies show that additional energy expenditure is between 50 to 200 calories following a high-intensity interval training session. So the question is, should you, listeners out there, do high-intensity interval training? And the answer to that is personal. You know, if you're relatively fit, if you're busy, I think high-intensity interval training is perfect for you. It burns a lot of calories in a short period of time, especially after you work out in that afterburn phase. However, if you have joint arthritis or spine conditions, it's probably better to initially stick with a low-intensity, steady-state cardio, build up that capacity, and then start incorporating some high-intensity exercises. You know that saying, no pain, no gain? It's very true for high-intensity. Many of the workouts are extremely physical. They could be harsh on your joints, doing exercises like burpees and squat jumps. So just depending where you are on your fitness journey, high intensity may not be the best place to start. But we know that there are benefits. Increased stamina, increased strength, fat burning, increased metabolic rate, stress relief, and also helping regulate blood sugar. I mean, all great health benefits when it comes to living your best life. Celebrity fitness trainer Jillian Michaels, she describes cardio as the least efficient form of exercise for weight loss. The reason for that is things that we've mentioned, because it's not metabolic. It does not cause the body to continue to burn calories post-workout. Whereas in high-intensity interval training, you get that benefit of not just burning calories while you work out, but burning calories after you work out. Certainly, HIT is becoming more and more popular, and steady-state cardio is dropping in years, but that doesn't mean it's not important to your health. I think mixing both forms of exercise is beneficial. So what about me? I incorporate a little bit of both high-intensity and low-to-moderate intensity. Now that I'm training for the marathon, my weekend runs are my low-intense, long-duration cardio workouts, but during the week, I still do some strength training, strength resistance training, some interval training, all which help increase my endurance and build muscle along the way. But the most important thing with any exercise, with changing any habit, it's that it's important to find something that you like. Sure, you can kill it on the spin bike every week and burn lots of calories or go to Orange Theory and a bunch of these classes, but if you don't enjoy them, you're not going to get good at it and you're going to hate every second of it. So pick something you enjoy and stick with it. Certainly both types of exercise, both methods have benefits. It's primarily based on what your preferences are and what your goals are, what you want to achieve. So thank you for tuning in to this second part of the science behind six pack abs, where we focused on exercise and movement is medicine and stay tuned for part three, where I talk specifically about building muscle for your core and really exposing that six pack that we all may desire. Thank you out there for tuning in to the backstory. And remember, when it comes to your health and wellness, 
we've got your back. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Backstory. Please subscribe, rate the podcast, and review The Backstory on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play Music. And feel free to share this podcast on social media or even your own website or blog. This podcast is for general information purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. To learn more about Dr. Singh and his clinical research, please follow him on social media. You can also sign up for his newsletter by going to www.rickysinghmd.com. That's R-I-C-K-Y-S-I-N-G-H-M-D.com.